my god, Infinity War, you got Marvel, 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 Avengers, 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 Thanos, Thanos, Thanos. Did you guys like see the movie or something? <sighs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm just so excited. With a movie that's 10 years in the making and full to the brim with every MCU character you can think of, well, uh, almost everyone, finally in theaters, and this being a DC animated universe channel, we gotta talk about Marvel any way we can. And you know what? I think I figured out the perfect way to do so. There are, believe it or not, a ton of Marvel Comics references and Easter eggs throughout the DCAU, even all the way back to the 90s Batman the Animated Series. Doing research for this video, we found some ones even we didn't realize were there. So let's dive right in, shall we? To be fair, this video contains some DCAU spoilers, so if you're not up to speed on 25 plus year old cartoons, I'm sorry. Hashtag keep epilogue a secret. We're gonna go in air date order, so look, some of these are more exciting than others, but there's some cool stuff in here, so just stick around, okay? Now let's get down to the nitty gritty, H cuties. Oh, I'm sorry. I I hate that guy. First things first, in the Batman episode, Robin's Reckoning, we get several flashbacks to Dick Grayson's childhood after he was adopted by Bruce Wayne. During one of these sequences, Batman is out looking for the Grayson's killer, Tony Zuko, and tracks him to Tony's uncle and Gotham mob boss, Arnold Stromwell. Here, Batman plants a bug on Stromwell's chair while uttering the phrase, If you protect him, Stromwell, I'll be very grumpy. You don't want to see me grumpy. Sound, uh, sound familiar? Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. How about now? No? Well, moving on. In the Superman episode Unity, Supergirl starts a cross-country bus trip to Metropolis after being left with a handful of comics by this Kansas kid who wants to try and get a piece of that Argo. One of these comics, as Kara disgustedly announces, is about fictional superhero Spider Power. Spider Powers? Ew! Obviously, this is a nod to Spider-Man, albeit a fictional version inside a DC Comics universe, inside the DC multiverse, inside our real world. Or maybe this isn't even the real world. Ooh, it makes you think, doesn't it? No? You just want me to move on to the next one? Well, why didn't you say so? I've got two words for you. Robert? Hayes. Hayes was the voice actor who portrayed Luminous in two Superman episodes, but did you know he also voiced Iron Man in most of the 90s Marvel cartoons? Well, I didn't, but now I do. And so do you. If you already knew, now you know again. Luminous flew around shooting light beams, so I guess that's sort of Iron Man-esque. Sorry if you're watching this, Robert. We love you. I think. Here's one of those spoilers. You ready for it? Ready? Here it is. Now, when Darkseid kills Dan Turpin in the Superman episode Apocalypse Now, sorry, you have to say it like that. That's that's how it's written. A funeral is held for the character, who is based visually on Jack Kirby, comic book artist and creator of the Fourth World New Gods, as well as creator or co-creator of many Marvel Comics properties like Thor, Fantastic Four, Ant-Man, Black Panther, Nick Fury, Magneto, the list goes on and on and on and on. In real life, Jack Kirby had just recently passed away, and because of his Dan Turpin homagingness, the original airing of this Superman episode actually featured appearances by many Marvel-related characters or figureheads related to Kirby, like Stan Lee, Tony Stark, Steve Rogers, The New Gods, The Fantastic Four. After the episode's debut, all future reruns aired with a replacement funeral crowd, mostly comprised of generic extras. We move on now to Batman Beyond, which, in a way, features two appearances by the Marvel villain MODOK. In the episode Gollum, Frank Watt is thrown into a crate of toys, which is really just a bunch of plushies of very MODOK-looking little guys. And later in Epilogue, the flashback's Royal Flush Gang King is based on MODOK as well. I know, Epilogue isn't actually a Batman Beyond episode, Episode, but it was a lot easier to lump these ones together, okay? Give me a break. You want me to dedicate more of this video to MODOK? Well, it's happening right now because I haven't changed the image yet. This is on you. Are you happy? Moving on, the episode Heroes focuses on the villains, but not really villains, but okay, actually villains, the terrific trio. Appearance and powers-wise, these guys are a pretty blatant homage to the Fantastic Four, 2D Man being a parallel for Mr. Fantastic, Freon being Invisible Woman, and Magma being a combo of the Human Torch and the Thing. They share different relationships with one another, however, with Magma and Freon being engaged, rather than being siblings like the Storms in the Fantastic Four. 2D Man just gets to be lonely, I guess. Poor 2D Man. Oh well. He got sucked into a fan. When the Joker returns in Return of the Joker, Bruce is deadpan angry bat face while Terry hypothesizes multiple ways Joker could still be alive and youthful-ish. 
suspended animation due to floating around frozen in a block of ice. This is a nod to the manner in which Marvel's Captain America managed to put himself on pause to unintentionally get from World War II to modern day. So that's cool. <laughs> cool? Like ice? Shut up and drive. Though it may not have been intentional, many people over the years have pointed out various similarities between the world of Batman Beyond and that of classic Spider-Man. For starters, Terry McGinnis' motivation to become a costume superhero is based off the death of a close family member with whom he just partook in a rather heated argument, much like Peter Parker's Uncle Ben. Then there's the whole high school premise, the jock bully, and the fact that Terry almost never shuts up when he's fighting the bad guys. Wait. I like to talk too. And then, there's the bad guys. There's quite a few parallels here, like in the cases of Derek Powers, Ink, Spellbinder, Stalker, Ten, Shriek. Hang on a second, these aren't the right images! Of course, there may be even more similarities between Batman Beyond's mise-en-scene and that of Spider-Man 2099. Like the futuristic slang, the Blade Runner cyberpunkiness, the maniacal businessman supervillain. I'll leave this one up to you guys to debate. So, there's a... Uh... <laughs> There's this Marvel character named Squirrel Girl, and <clears throat> in the Zeta Project episode on The Wire, there's also a, a character named uh, Squirrel Girl. So that's this one. Much like Spider Power, Squirrel Girl is a fictional character within this fictional world, and though she's partners with basically Watchmen's Night Owl, she may or may not be a personified reference to the Marvel heroine. Moving over to Static Shock, the episode Winds of Change features a scene that takes place in Off Your Rocket, a Dakota comic store. Not to be confused with Dakota Comics. Duh. Inside, we get the name drop Denny Miller, a fictional comic book creator within the DCAU, whose name is a combo of comic book greats Denny O'Neill and Frank Miller. Though O'Neill is well known in the DC fan base for creating characters like Azrael, Monarch, and Raz al Ghul. You heard me. Raz. Ask Neil Adams, as well as writing for Wonder Woman, Justice League of America, Green Arrow, and many other titles, he actually started out at Marvel Comics working under Stan Lee, and returned to Marvel in 1980, after which he wrote for Daredevil, Iron Man, and The Amazing Spider-Man with Frank Miller. Later in the episode Tantrum, the Bang Baby Tantrum is notably a big hulking monster who is really a high school kid who transforms when he, uh, when he gets angry. It doesn't really get more on the nose than that. He's, like, purple though, which is different, so he's actually more like the infragable crunk when you think about it. <laughs> Don't think about it. Back to Spider-Boy, we get another reference to Marvel's wall crawler in the Static Shock episode Static in Africa. When Static first meets local hero Anansi, the latter displays a series of superheroic feats that lead young Mr. Hawkins to a certain request. Hit him with a web blast! I am not that kind of spider. Does, uh, does this mean Spider-Man exists in the DCAU? Did we miss putting him in this video? Probably not, so... Does he exist fictionally like Zorro or Tiny Toons? Or maybe Spider Power does this exact same web shooty hand thing? I don't know, man. It's... It's something. Near the end of Static Shock's run, the episode Linked showcases dueling Bang Baby's Dule Jones and his friend Troy, who both happen to have, well, essentially big metal Dr. Octopus arms. Dule winds up being able to somehow hide them underneath his clothing, but Troy cannot, so he decides to become a villain named Chainlink. Why didn't the creators just make him like Bullwhip from Batman Beyond? His Dr. Octopus arms at least came out of his wrists or something. Not directly out of his spine, you know, exactly like Dr. Octopus. I call this section Little League, because there's a bunch of little stuff in Justice League that doesn't need its own segment of the video. Do you get the funny joke now? In Paradise Lost, this magical staff thing Flash accidentally sets off has a totem on top that looks a flippin' heck of a lot like the Eye of Agamotto of Doctor Strange fame. There's also this giant robot remote piloted by Lex Luthor in the opening of Legends that bears a notable resemblance to Ultron, and even this thing had a longer age than the MCU guy, <laughs> am I right? And in For the Man Who Has Every Thing, though the small happy brainiac thingy is more reminiscent of classic Fortress of Solitude robots than anything, he does look a bit like the Fantastic Four's Robochum Herbie. There are quite a few Marvel references in the Savage Time, either because notable Marvel properties revolve around World War II, or because Bruce Tim likes Marvel stuff, or both. Or neither. In any case, we get a Human Torch look-alike moment when Superman flies through a plane, covering himself in flaming jet fuel. But don't worry, the pilot's safely ejected. No killing Nazis for this guy. 
Jon Stewart also happens to hop aboard a big Nazi plane full of weapons headed to conquer Europe and pilots it into the water. Though, Green Lantern at least gets saved by Hawk Girl. Rip. Finally, we get a nod to the Howling Commandos era Nick Fury, in which a suspiciously Fury looking soldier gets his eye injured in battle. He's even got that little hair floopy. Look at that. We get a couple episodes that revolve around a little super team comprised of Defenders analogs. The first is The Terror Beyond, which showcases Doctor Fate, Aquaman, and Solomon Grundy, or Doctor Strange, the Submariner, and the Hulk, respectively, aka the original Defenders lineup from 1971, who are later joined by Hawk Girl, who could be considered a mix of Nighthawk and Valkyrie, or maybe Wonder Woman is Valkyrie? But then, who is Superman? Luke Cage? Also, Inza, Doctor Fate's wife, is like Clea, I guess. She was Doctor Strange's disciple and lover. That's what Wikipedia says anyway, at least until one of you goes and changes it right now. Later in the JLU episode, Wake the Dead, we get another team up of most of these guys, this time with the Amazo android added to the roster who represents the Silver Surfer. He would have made a more obvious Silver Surfer if he was still silver, but I'll take what I can get. Back to that Terror Beyond episode, we also get a visual nod to Steve Ditko's work on Doctor Strange within the topsy-turvy dimension of Ikthultu, and the screaming hand monster things that Grundy crushed so good are very reminiscent of Marvel's The Mindless Ones, inhabitants of the Dark Dimension first faced by Doctor Strange in 1964. And in the same episode, the military commander and his men who are out to take down Solomon Grundy may be a nod to General Thunderbolt Ross and the Hulkbusters, a group Ross led in the comics for the same purpose of hunting the Hulk. The commander dude even bears a mustachioed resemblance to Ross, and though he does seem to detest superpowered beings, we've yet to see him return and hand the Justice League a copy of the Covenant Accords. The second Royal Flush Gang to appear in the DCAU, but chronologically the first to exist, or the third who can keep it all straight, appeared in the JL episode Wild Cards, and while perhaps the most talked about easter egg surrounding this team is their Teen Titans voice cast, another comparison can be made to their powers, which are similar to the Fantastic Four. The Tim boys really like their Fant Four stick, let me tell ya. King utilizes fire powers like Human Torch, Ten is super strong and nearly impossible to harm like the Thing, Jack is, as the Joker puts it, a flexible kinda guy, like good old Mr. Fantastic, and Ace's reality warping mind powers make her a close enough parallel to Franklin Richards, the similarly powered son of Reed and Sue in the comics. Queen is the odd one out with no notable invisibility or force field shenanigans up her sleeve, but she does control metal through magnetism kind of like a certain other Marvel character. Polaris, I'm talking about Polaris. Though this one isn't strictly a DC animated universe comparison and the characters are purposeful ripoffs in the main DCU, the Extremists, a supervillain team fought by the League in Shadow of the Hawk, are individually based on Marvel bad guys. Tracer is Sabretooth, Gorgon is Dr. Octopus, Dream Slayer is Dormammu, and Lord Havoc is Dr. Doom. That's just synonyms, man. You can do better than that. Patriot Act opens with a black and white sequence depicting the Spy Smasher breaking up a military experiment to create a super soldier using a special serum that would make this guy all buff and stuff. Sound familiar? In the DCAU, it doesn't work out well because these guys are Nazis, and Nazis are bad, and the serum is filed away with Cadmus. You know, the safest place to keep it. Eventually, in order to try and take down Superman, General Eiling steals the serum and injects it into himself, in a very abomination-like origin for DC's The General, which is definitely different than how it happened in the comics. If you don't know who the Shaggy Man is, look him up, because... Oh boy. In the finale to JLU and the DCAU as a whole, we get a few final Marvel nods as the creative team took their last chance to throw them in. These include Commander Steel, an American flag-clad superhero, throwing a shield in a very cap-like manner, Ice transforming herself from bikini to super leotard in the same way the 80s cartoon Iceman used to do it, except for the bikini part? Maybe? And a few subtle Kirby-like Marvel bros hanging out on the source wall, like this guy who's all, oh no, I'm not Galactus, don't even worry about it. This last one isn't actually an on-screen Marvel reference, but there was a pretty cool little comic that came out in 1996, during a time when Marvel and DC were playing nice and crossing their characters over with one another, which slapped together Batman and Wolverine into the new character Dark Claw. As a spin-off, a one-shot title was released the next year, Dark Claw Adventures, which saw the character in a Batman the Animated Series style appearance drawn by the great Ty Templeton. And we're done, I think. Oh wait, we forgot Captain Marvel. G 
get it, please donate to our Patreon, patreon.com slash JTS Entertainment. That's all, folks. Did we miss any Marvel references in the DCAU? Comment below if you spotted anything else, and let us know what you thought of Infinity War! Be sure to give the video a like if you liked it, and consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell so you don't miss out on other upcoming content from the Watchtower Database.